So it says National 5 Biology 3.34 Synthesis. So start off with the equation, press pause and see if you can do this. So carbon dioxide taken out of the air, water taken up from the roots and it gets converted into sugar and oxygen. So oxygen is a waste product for plants. Second of all, just a bit of revision from unit two. I'm wondering if you can do this. So two, name the two structures which carry water and sugar through a plant. And then number three, describe the journey of water into and out of a plant. Let's pause again. So the two structures are xylem, they carry water, they're the ones that contain the lignin, they're just dead hollow tubes. And then you've got the phloem which carries sugar. And then three, describe the journey of water into and out of a plant. So in a series of stages, you've got the water first of all entering the root hair cells by osmosis. Then it travels up the plant in the xylem. Uh, once it gets there, I don't know if you mentioned this, it could be used for photosynthesis. Um, if it's not, or if there's an excess, then it may evaporate in the air spaces and then leave the plant via the stomata. Didn't mention here though the process, the name of this process, if you remember that, that's transpiration when it leaves uh, the plant via stomata. And you could have a look at this, the, and just, just to maybe refresh your memory, um, you may not have access to Twig now, but if you have a look at YouTube, there's the photosynthesis song which takes you through the takes you through what happens. So there is our general equation again, and it requires light energy, of course. I'm hoping that you remember which part of the plant cell it takes part it takes place in, and that is the chloroplast. And then within the chloroplast, you need light for this. And um, so within the chloroplast, there's a pigment which is called chlorophyll. Uh, and it traps light energy and it converts it into chemical energy in the form of ATP. Okay, and the ATP is then used to make sugar and we'll, we'll, we'll go through how exactly that happens. So we know the general equation, but then you have to split it into two stages. So you've got stage one, which is the light reactions and then you've got stage two, which is carbon fixation. So you need to describe the stages. You could do it as kind of flow chart or using arrows. And then also when the sugar is produced, there's various things that the plant can do with it. So you can um, you can outline what what those are. So the light reactions to begin with, and you have got sunlight, and there are two things that the sunlight does. So again, it's always good to think back to the equation, what's being used up. So one of them was water. And what happens is water is split into its constituent elements. So water is H2O. So what is it produced? What does it produce? That is oxygen and hydrogen. Okay. Light energy does something else though, and that is that it's, it's converted into another form of energy, and that is ATP. Okay, so light energy converted into chemical energy in the form of ATP. And this little diagram here is, these are the pigments within the chloroplast, the chlorophyll. So just in summary, you've got the light energy trapped by chlorophyll in chloroplasts. It is then converted to ATP, which is chemical energy, and our ATP gets passed on to stage two. Alongside that, the second thing that light does is light energy also splits water into oxygen and hydrogen. Oxygen diffuses out of the chloroplast as waste and hydrogen passes on to stage two. So oxygen, you know, is something that is required, you know, for complex life on this planet. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for plants carrying out this process and producing oxygen and putting oxygen up to the atmospheric level it is at the moment. Um, but for a plant, it's just to get rid of it. It's a waste product. Here's just another little summary of that. So light energy is converted into chemical energy. You don't have to worry too much about this. This is just uh, ADP and phosphate is what makes up ATP. The key thing here is it makes ATP. Um, and also the we have water being split into oxygen, which is a waste product. So it diffuses out 
and hydrogen is important. It goes on to stage two along with the ATP. And here is stage two. So what were our two things, the uh, two substances which came from stage one? They were hydrogen and ATP. And if you're going to make sugar, sugar is a carbohydrate. So I don't know if you know the three, el three elements that you find in carbohydrates. You've got hydrogen along with carbon and oxygen. So this is where our carbon dioxide comes in, if you remember the original equation. And sugar is produced and it's generally glucose. And as in most metabolic reactions, chemical reactions in the body, enzymes in the chloroplast use the hydrogen and the ATP from stage one to convert carbon dioxide into sugar. Okay, so you could press pause and have a go at this. So let's have a look at the answer. So inside number one is a chloroplast. Number two depicts light energy. Number three, water and water is split into oxygen and three is hydrogen. And then four, light energy is converted into chemical energy in the form of ATP. And then our hydrogen is combined with number five, CO2, to produce glucose. Now, the sugar produced glucose, there's various things that can happen with it. Um, some of them you'll be familiar with. The first one is, you'll know that this is mitosis. Now, mitosis requires energy to happen. And can you think of the process in which plants use energy to, or, or produce energy to carry out different processes? It's respiration. So if you reverse the photosynthesis equation, you get the respiration equation. So the glucose that's used can immediately be used for respiration and producing ATP for cellular processes, for example, mitosis, um, active transport is another one that we've covered um, that the energy could be used for. What does this represent? Well, this represents a more complex carbohydrate than glucose, and that is starch. So the molecules, molecules are joined together to form um, storage carbohydrate, starch, so, for example, in potato tubers, so um, potato plants, what they do is they kind of excess glucose that they produce. Sorry, I interrupted there. So, uh, when, if they have got excess glucose, then they'll send it down to the roots, and what we call the potato is the potato plant's tuber, and they store the glucose as starch. Starch is basically glucose joined together. Now, humans come along and dig that up and eat it, but um, if we were just to leave it, then you'd have a, a potato plant would grow out of it um, the following year when conditions became favourable again. And then the final option for the glucose, it can be converted into another type of carbohydrate. Um, again, something that we've covered, cell walls have a particular carbohydrate in it. It's called cellulose. So the glucose can be converted to the structural carbohydrate cellulose and it's, you, it's a constituent that's used to make up plant cell walls. Here's another little film you can watch if you like. If you Google this BBC film light and starch production, you'll find this. And just to finish off this little bit, just to see if you're, if you've understood this, see if you can copy and complete this. So press pause. So top left, we have light energy. It can do two things. It can split water into oxygen um, and hydrogen, and the one that diffuses out as waste is oxygen. Similarly, light energy can be converted to ATP. ATP and hydrogen go into stage two, and during stage two, carbon from carbon dioxide is fixed, they say, into glucose. Okay, so that's what that should look like. Here's just a little past paper question related to this as well, which you can have a go at if you press pause. So photosynthesis is a two-stage process used by green plants to produce food. The diagram below represents a summary of the first stage of photosynthesis. Complete the diagram by filling in the three boxes, selecting terms from the list in the box below. So the name of the first stage 
light reactions. The two products that are used in stage two after the sun or light energy from the sun has split water is ATP and hydrogen and diffusing out of the leaf is oxygen. And then describe the second stage of photosynthesis. You could have done a little drawing for this. Um, it's, there's not an awful lot to say for your two marks. So you get glucose produced would be the first bit. And then the second is to say the ATP provides energy um, or provides energy to make this happen. Or you could say, hi you need to mention ATP, but you say ATP provides energy or hydrogen combines with ATP or ATP reacts with hydrogen, I suppose, um, and joins with carbon dioxide in order to produce the sugar. So if you just did this two minutes ago, then I would suggest you probably don't look at it just now. What the idea is, maybe let a bit of time pass and then try this again. So if you've not had a break, have one now and come back in tomorrow, maybe, or a couple of days time. And once you've done that, press pause and see if you can do this. So photosynthesis, again, always um, refer back to the original equation, which is carbon dioxide um, plus water produces oxygen and glucose. So light energy converts water into oxygen and hydrogen. It also gets converted itself into another form of energy, chemical energy in the form of ATP. And then ATP and hydrogen um, combine, or the hydrogen combines with carbon dioxide to produce glucose. Something else we, we talked about, I wonder if you can remember, there's, once you produce the sugar or the glucose, there's three things that the plant can do with it. So if you could write those down. Three things that the plant can do, they can, it can use the glucose immediately for respiration and that releases um, energy or produces ATP um, for processes like mitosis. So, you know, quite often people think Animals carry it respiration and plants carry it photosynthesis, but plants will do both. So they'll use light energy to produce glucose, but then they will immediately use the glucose um, in order to produce energy to carry out mitosis and so on. Second thing is they just store it. So they turn the glucose into starch. And the third thing that they could possibly do is they could turn it into the, a structural carbohydrate, cellulose and that makes up plant cell walls. So the next part of this is talking about limiting factors and how they affect photosynthesis and plant growth. So there are three limiting factors that we mentioned in the course and we can maybe work this out. If any are low or missing, then the rate of photosynthesis and consequently plant growth is reduced. And, you know, thinking about um, conditions plant needs, plants need to grow, you can have a think yourself just now about what those three things, you know, substances, conditions, environmental conditions might be. So the first one is light intensity. So we're in winter at the moment, so you have a reduced uh, growth of plants. They're hardly growing at all, and some of them are pretty much shut down for the winter. And that is the energy source for the light reaction stage. That's the first limiting factor. The second one is a carbon dioxide concentration. So it's coming from the air. You need it to make sugar. Um, and that's happening in the carbon fixation stage. This, the, the third one, I suppose, kind of relates to what I was talking about winter. And that's temperature. So the enzymes that are involved in uh, the second stage carbon fixation they have, there's a temperature at which they work best, I'm hoping you remember this, an optimum. Okay, so they have an optimum temperature and if the the um, temperature is not what it should be, then plant growth will be reduced. And here's a YouTube film that you can have a look at, just put that into, put that into YouTube. And when we, look at you, when we look at limiting factors, we quite often see graphs like this, or you're, if it was an exam, you'd be asked to interpret graphs like this. So what you've got is rate of photosynthesis on the y-axis, and then on the x-axis, you've got the particular limiting factor. 
light intensity. So if we look at this graph, what we would say is at this point here, the evidence suggests that the limiting factor is light intensity because if you increase the light intensity further, then the rate goes up. Okay, so, so the limiting factor is light intensity at this point. When you get up here, no matter how much you increase the light intensity, the rate of photosynthesis no longer increases. So what that suggests is that at this point in time, light intensity is no longer limiting the reaction. So the, li the limiting factors up here would be the other two. So that's temperature or carbon dioxide concentration. If you look at this graph, I mean, it looks identical, doesn't it? Except this time we've got carbon dioxide concentration on the x-axis. So probably you're going to notice a pattern here. So the carbon dioxide concentration is the limiting factor at this point. Okay. So basically, whatever's on the x-axis is going to be the limiting limiting factor at the point which the graph is increasing. Once you get up here, keep on increasing carbon dioxide concentration, no increase in the rate of the reaction. So up here, the two limiting factors are going to be temperature or light intensity. And the third one, this looks a bit different, but I think you might know why that looks a bit different. So remember what happens to it, what enzymes are involved in carrying out photosynthesis. So if the temperature gets too high, what's going to happen to the enzymes? They'll be denatured. So you don't just get it leveling off, you actually get the reaction just falls away completely. So similarly in this one, temperature's on the x-axis, so limiting factor at this point must be temperature, and then up the top is going to be light intensity and then this carbon dioxide concentration. Okay, how about we go at this? So we've got um, the effect of light intensity and the rate of photosynthesis. See if you can write down what the limiting factor is at A, B and C. So A, I hope you've paused it and had a go at this. So A is light intensity, because that's what's in the x-axis. Then up here, this tells you that at 1% CO2, the rate is here, whereas at 2%, the rate is here. So that means that B, carbon dioxide, must be a limiting factor because it can be increased further. Then you're left with the third one, so C must be temperature. So I just wanted um, just to finish off, I'll have a look at a comparison between respiration and photosynthesis. It's quite common for students to get respiration and photosynthesis mixed up, so let's just kind of get them right in our heads. So respiration, you start off with glucose and it gets broken down into two pyruvate. And this first stage is in the cytoplasm. It's anaerobic, it doesn't require oxygen sometimes. Um, you can, it also leads into fermentation if you don't have oxygen in stage two. Then stage two, this is aerobic and the pyruvate has moved into the mitochondria and you get carbon dioxide and water produced. But the key thing for respiration is you get many ATP. Photosynthesis, on the other hand, looks like this. So the source of energy uh, for respiration is glucose. Here, it's light energy. Okay, and your end product this time is glucose. So you can see it's kind of the reverse. Carbon dioxide and water are used in photosynthesis, whereas they are produced in respiration. So see if you can copy and complete that table. This will be a nice, a nice little table to have just to kind of compare and contrast. So press pause and do this. So the purpose of respiration is to break down glucose to produce chemical energy, ATP, and then the ATP can be used for various different processes in the cell. Respiration happens in two locations, which are the cytoplasm and the mitochondria. The equation is as follows. So glucose plus oxygen gives carbon dioxide and water, and it occurs in all organisms, all living things. Um, as far as I know, anyway, at least the, the vast majority, maybe some simple organisms don't carry it out, but um, yeah, the majority. Photosynthesis, it uses light energy to split water and fix carbon dioxide into glucose. And it is happening only in chloroplasts 
and the equation is the reverse of what you're seeing here. So carbon dioxide plus water gives glucose and oxygen. And plants is probably what you put here, but there are other photosynthetic organisms. Um, plants evolved later um, than, than these, I believe. So you could also talk about algae and some bacteria can carry out photosynthesis as well. So just again, have a look at a wee past paper question. So describe the transfer from of energy from light arriving at the leaf to the formation of sugar. Okay, and the key word here is energy. So try that for three marks. Press pause. So what they're looking for, first of all, you'd say that light energy is trapped by chlorophyll. Okay, then you can say it's converted into ATP. Then that's stage one dealt with. You can say ATP goes from stage one to stage two. And then you can finish by saying um, the chemical energy is converted into sugar. So because it's asking about energy, there's no requirement for you to talk about hydrogen or, or water or carbon dioxide. If you had, that's OK, as long as you mentioned, you know, you kind of went down the route of talking about light energy and then ATP and then finally sugar. OK, another break. So here are some um, problem solving questions that I've just put in as well. Um, these are from unit one, but I'm hoping that you can, you can, uh, you know, you should be able to do these and it's good practice nonetheless. So not necessarily related to photosynthesis, but um, worth, worth doing. So four cylinders, so just pause as we go through these and write down your answer. So four cylinders of potato tissue were weighed and each was placed into a salt solution of a different concentration. The cylinders were reweighed after one hour and the results are shown below. In which salt solution would most potato cells be plasmalized? So if they're plasmalized, then they're losing water. So if they're losing water, then there's going to be a decrease in mass. So the answer there is A, and it's got the biggest decrease in mass. And the question was, most potato cells be plasmalized? Number two, the graph shows the concentration of ions in a single-celled organism and the seawater surrounding it. Use the graph to identify which of the following statements is correct. So for this one, the answer is D. So you've got potassium, high level of potassium in the organism and a low concentration in the in the seawater there. So potassium ions will have to move into the organism by act, will have to move into the organism by active transport. Okay, because you're going from uh, a low to a high concentration. The other ones are all incorrect. So for example, the first one, sodium ions will move into the organism by active transport. That's not right, is it? Because it's going to go from a higher to a lower concentration. Number three, the diagram shows an experiment in which a model cell was placed in a sucrose solution. At the start of the experiment, the model weighed 25 grams and at the end it weighed 30 grams. So what was the percentage increase in mass? So it's change over original times 100. So it's 5 over, it's gone from 25 to 30. So it's 5 over 25 times 100. And that gives you an answer of C. It's a 20% increase. Number four, four flasks were set up to investigate the production of carbon dioxide during respiration. So here they are. Lime water turns increasingly cloudy as more carbon dioxide is passed through it. Predict what would happen if only worm, one worm was used in flask L. The lime water in flask would what? Okay, pause, have a think, read again and write down your answer. So for this one, M would turn cloudy more slowly. So what you're assuming here is that the, the worms are carrying out respiration. So if they're carrying out respiration, then they are going to produce carbon dioxide and the lime water would turn cloudy as they're carrying out, car carrying out respiration. If in here there are five worms, so if you um, take four of them away, then there's going to be less respiration, they're going to produce less carbon dioxide, and consequently the lime water is going to be less cloudy, or it would turn cloudy more slowly. 
5, a cell with 10 chromosomes divided by mitosis, which row in the table identifies the number of daughter cells produced and the number of chromosomes in each daughter cell. OK, pause and have a go. So this is C. So if you have got 10 chromosomes and you're divided by mitosis, then the you're going to have two daughter cells. However, the number of chromosomes is not, is not going to alter. You're always going to have the, the 10. OK. So you've got 46 chromosomes in each of your cells. Every time your cell divides, each new cell is identical. And um, so it's going to have 46 in it as well. So 5 is C. Uh, the number 6, the apparatus shown below, was used to investigate the movement of water into and out of a model cell. The model cell had a selectively permeable membrane. Explain how this process caused the liquid level to rise. Pause. So for this, what's happened is you've got more, you've got a higher concentration of water outside the bag than inside. So water is moved into the bag by diffusion, but you don't even need to say by diffusion. But um, you need to say the sec, you need to say that you've got it's gone from a higher water concentration to a lower water concentration or down a concentration gradient. And uh, next, so same question, calculate the average rate of movement of liquid in the glass tubing. So you're using the table for this. So it has moved up uh, at zero, it was 10 millimetres and it's gone up to 64. So it's gone up by 54 in 60 minutes. So 54 divided by 60 gives you an answer of 0 0.9 millimetres per minute. Number eight, when the investigation was repeated, the average rate of movement of liquid was slower. Suggests one difference in the way that the investigation was set up that could have caused this change in results. So why would things have gone more slowly? Press pause. So some sort of change. So it could be that there was a smaller concentration gradient, or it could be, you might have said, there was, say, 5% salt in there. Um, if there was a lower temperature, a wider capillary tube, the seal was not as tight, there was less water in the beaker, not fully submerged. So some sort of change that would be um, some sort of change there that, that would make the, the, the liquid move up more slowly. But yeah, the one that kind of first came to mind to me was if you had the water in the bag was a more similar concentration to the water outside. So if you imagine that's 100% water, and that would say 99% water and 1% salt. That would be an example of a correct answer. Number nine, the diagram below shows how the enzyme lactase is used in the production of lactose-free milk. That gives you all the description here. It says a fault in the production resulted in boiling water running over the lactase enzyme. Using your knowledge of enzymes to predict how the milk produced would differ from the expected product. Okay, pause and write down an answer for that. So I suppose the end, the explanation maybe of what you came up with first. So if you've poured boiling water over an enzyme, it's going to be denatured, or you could say the active site's changed shape. So as a result of that, the enzyme lactase would not be working at its optimum. So that would mean that you wouldn't have all the lactose broken down. So that could be that be an answer. Lactose would not be removed from the milk, the milk would contain lactose, or it would not be lactose free. Number 10, the bacterium below represents part of the process of genetic engineering. And the bacteria has have an initial concentration of 1,000 cells per centimetre cubed. Each cell divides once every 30 minutes. Calculate how long it will take for the concentration to become greater than 15,000 cells per um, centimetre cubed. So you're, this is the, the one we're doing, it's 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, 8,000. So if you carry that on, um, after 30 minutes, you're going to have 2,000, 60 minutes, 4,000 and so on. So to get there, it's going to be two hours or 120 minutes. Next one, number 11, an investigation was carried out into the effect of pH on the activity of the enzyme pepsin. A petri dish was filled with cloudy protein agar. Six holes were made in the agar and each was filled with pepsin solution at the pH value shown. 
when the protein is broken down, cloudy agar becomes clear. So that would suit the enzyme is working then. The dish was examined after 24 hours and the diameter of the clear area around each hole was measured. The larger the clear area, the more active the enzyme. Okay, so answer the question. So two variables which should be controlled to make this experiment valid. There's a few that you can mention. Temperature, volume of pepsin solution, don't say amount. Concentration of pepsin, spacing of holes, size of wells, depth of wells, diameter. Any two of those for one mark. For the next one, how many days does it take for the substrate concentration to decrease by 50%? Okay. Press pause, put down an answer. So substrate concentration is here and it starts off, its dashed line starts off at 6. So how long does it take to get down to 3? And that is there, which is 4 days. They're trying to confuse you here, aren't they, by having the, you know, the double x double y axis so you've just got to work out what they're what you're looking at so substrates over here so it's a dashed line 50 percent of six is three so it's four days 13 the diagram shows an experiment which can be used to find the energy content of different foods each food was completely burned and the energy content was estimated by the rise in temperature of the water the reliability of this experiment could be improved by Pause, write an answer. So this is B. So if you're looking at reliability, what you're doing is instead of doing the experiment once, you're doing it five times. So you're looking for something to do with repeating. So it says repeating the experiment with each food several times is the answer. It does say down here repeating the experiment using a different food, but um, what they were looking at was the difference between these individual foods so you just needed to repeat each of them rather than introduce new ones number 14 the apparatus shown which was used to investigate the rate of respiration in yeast at 20 degrees c which of the following changes would cause a decrease in the rate of respiration of the yeast okay press pause So if you decrease the concentration of the glucose solution by 1%, that would do it because you are not going to, there's not as much glucose to be broken down essentially by the yeast. So you would have a reduced rate of reaction. 15 proteins are broken down in the stomach into polypeptides. The graph shows the concentration of proteins and polypeptides in the stomach over 90 minutes. The ratio of protein concentration to polypeptide concentration in the stomach after 30 minutes is what? Okay, so read that again, have a look at the graph, press pause, and then check if you've got the answer right. So the answer here is 5 to 3. So the protein at 30 minutes is 60, and then down here, 1, 2, 3, 4. Five, that's going to be 36. So it's 60 to 36. And then you simplify that and it goes to 5 to 3. That's right, isn't it? Yep. Okay, this is one of these kind of scientific literacy questions. So have a read of that and then do the answers. So 16, identify an aspect in the planning of the investigation that would suggest that the hypothesis might not be proven correct. Okay, so what was something a bit dodgy that might make results invalid? So you can see that they've got different numbers of sheep in each group. So they've had 9 in one and 15 in another, so that would be something. Or you could say the numbers might just be too small. And then 17, a further investigation proved that the hypothesis was correct. Describe how this investigation could help farmers to select only sheep with a low percentage of fat to provide meat for consumers following a low fat diet. So, only select those with low levels of catalase. Okay, because according to this, if they've got lower catalase, then they're going to have a lower, <clears throat> a lower percentage of fat. The table below shows the average percentage of dark and light tissue cells. These cells were found in the muscles of athletes training for different events at the 2014 Commonwealth Games in Scotland. So using information in the table, identify which type of athlete would, be, would likely produce the most lactic acid in their muscle cells <clears throat> and justify your answer.
okay so it would be the sprinter and the reason being that like the highest lactic acid produced when oxygen is not used to release energy or the highest percentage of light tissue although i'm just looking at this and i'm thinking you might require previous you might require more information so <laughs> yeah apology about this man i don't think you can work this out can you no, there's some information missing from that, so don't worry about, <laughs> about that, because I've, I've, that's confused me too. There's a mistake here. I think you, you can do this one, though. So a sample of muscle tissue from an athlete was examined and found to contain a total of 360 cells. 90 of these cells were light tissue cells. Identify which type of athlete the sample was taken from. So that's going to be the swimmer, because 90 out of 360 is 25%. Next one, have a read of that and then try the question. So suggest why the eggs were bloated dry before re-weighing. So um, what they were doing was they were measuring the mass and obviously if they hadn't bloated them dry then water would affect the results. Okay, So it's to remove excess surface water, liquid or solution or so the water doesn't affect the results. And then choose either beaker A or B and explain how osmosis caused the change in mass of the eggs in that beaker. So if you said beaker A, you could say water entered the egg from a higher water concentration to a lower water concentration. If it was B, it's the opposite. So water left the egg, moving from a higher water concentration to a lower water concentration. Next one, the field of view of a light microscope measures two millimetres in diameter. 20 plant cells were counted in a line across the diameter. Calculate the average size of a cell in micrometres. Okay. So it's going to be 100 micrometers. So if you've got 20 plant cells in 2 millimetres and 1 millimetre is equal to 1,000 micrometres, then you're just doing um, 2,000 divided by 20, which gives you 100. OK, pause and do this one, 23 and 24. So 23 is just an average of these three numbers, and that gives you 285. The next one, um, why would skin epithelium, muscle lymphocyte cells have higher numbers of mitochondria? What do mitochondria do? They produce energy. So a simple answer for that would be they use more energy or they, they, they need more ATP. 